phase changes are, are really just transformations. So the, what makes it different, uh, makes it a little bit different from what we've been seeing so far, these other transformations, is that phase changes are going from one phase to another. And this happens because energy is either being added or removed to a system. Okay, and usually this energy we say it's going to be heat. Heat's going to be added or removed. So there's three main equilibria or transformations that we want to take a look at. And these are all known as dynamic equilibria. Because we're, we're seeing something shift from, in our, you know, right in front of our eyes. So there's going to be the liquid vapor equilibrium, the liquid solid equilibrium, and then the solid vapor equilibrium. So, uh, again, vapor, that's going to be a gas solid. We represent that with an with a S. Liquid is going to be an L. So we're looking at a liquid going into a gas. We're looking at a liquid going to a solid. And then we're going to see a solid go to a gas. And then once we have information about all three of these scenarios or these three transformations, then what we can put together, our end game is to put together a phase diagram, which summarizes the conditions at which a substance exits as, or exists, sorry, exists as a solid, liquid, or a gas. Okay, so let's talk about our first, our first transformation, going from liquid to the vapor or gas phase. What's really going on? So, uh, what, uh, so at the very beginning, think of it this way. Let's say we got a glass of water, okay? So you, one thing you're going to learn about me this semester, I am a bad draw, drawer, so here we go. So let's say you got a glass, and here you got water, okay? And then at the top of the get glass, you got nothing, okay? It's, we know it's there. There's, you know, there is stuff there, but let's assume there's nothing. So the very first thing, what's going to happen is that the molecules in the water, the water molecules, are going to go mostly in one direction. They're going to go up and out. They're going to go from the liquid phase into the gas phase, okay? And once that happens, those molecules, that we start to have molecules in the vapor phase, the molecules uh, begin to, or those liquid molecules that now are gaseous, they begin to exhibit a vapor phase. And as the concentration of molecules in the vapor phase increase, some will actually start returning back to the liquid phase through the process of condensation. So let, let's get some terms down. So condensation, this is when the gas you're in the gas phase and you're becoming a liquid. Okay, And the way this happens... a molecule strikes the surface strikes the surface of the liquid and becomes trapped by the intermolecular forces in the liquid by the intermolecular forces, IMFs, in the liquid. Okay. And then the liquid molecules are constantly moving, but they're not as free as gases because, again, it, you know, they, they don't, they're, they're pretty much bound to the shape that they're, you know, the, the material that they're in. And because of this, the collision rate is going to be higher than in gases because there's not very much empty space. So the reason for that, little space between the molecules. Okay. 
And once molecules or when molecules have sufficient energy to escape from the surface, a phase change occurs. All right, so let me write this down and I'll, I'll kind of explain this a little bit. So when molecules have sufficient energy to escape from the surface, a phase change occurs. All right, so going back to what I was saying earlier, let me erase uh, all the arrows that I was drawing earlier. So you've got all these water molecules that are in the liquid stage, and I'm just drawing them in, in as dots, okay? So let's say this one, and I'm gonna circle it right there, that one wants to go from the liquid stage to a vapor stage. The only way that's going to happen is for that molecule to gain enough energy that it's going to break all of the intermolecular forces that's holding that molecule in. So how does, how does a molecule get that energy? Heat. That's an easy one. Heat. Depending on where you're getting, you know, if, you, if you're letting this water sit out in the sunlight, you could get it from sunlight too. Again, it's also heat. So once this mole once this molecule is being heated up, it's getting heat from you know it's picking up the heat that's being given to the system. Eventually, once it has enough energy to break all the intermolecular forces that's holding it back, it can transfer or it can move from the liquid stage to the vapor to the vapor stage. Okay, so. The process by which a molecule goes from the liquid to the moves from liquid to vapor, we call that either evaporation or vaporization, either way. Okay. And so, what we're looking at, these two pictures right here, these two graphs, are basically talking about th that process of evaporation. So, you'll notice that you've got a curve, and you've got this is going to be measured at a certain temperature and time. We call that T1. We don't know what that temperature is. But no, no matter what temperature, you're always going to have a fraction of molecules that are going to possess that enough kinetic energy that they can break those bounds, that they can break those intermolecular forces. And so the, those mo that fraction of the molecules that can break the intermolecular forces, we color those in pink. Okay. Now, if I increase the temperature just a little bit, so then we look at this picture T2, we notice that the curve has flattened. Okay, so the temperature is definitely increased, which means that you've got a wide variety of molecules with with varying energies. But as the temperature increased, so did that fraction of molecules that also has that am that amount of energy. Okay, so the rate of evaporation is constant at any temperature, and the rate of condensation increases with increasing concentrations of molecules in the vapor phase. So evaporation, the rate of evaporation is going to be constant. It doesn't go up, doesn't go down. It just stays flat. But the rate going backwards, okay, the rate of condensation, which is the back, the reverse, will increase with increasing concentration of molecules in the vapor phase. So the more molecules in the vapor phase, the more likely that the rate of condensation is going to increase because you've got more molecules ready or willing to go back to the liquid phase. Okay, so what happens when the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation are equal? Well, when that happens, once the rates are equal, A dynamic equilibrium is set up. Okay, and that means that the rate of condensation is balanced by the rate of evaporation.
Okay, so it doesn't mean that the concentrations are equal. It just means that the rate of one part, or, or the rate of one property, or the rate of one thing, is going to be the same or the opposite of the other. Okay, and we can actually measure this vapor pressure when this dynamic equilibrium is set up. We call this the equilibrium vapor pressure. All right, so we can also get a numerical value for the strength of the intermolecular forces in a liquid. And that value is called the molar heat of vaporization. Okay. And so we measure, we represent the molar heat of vaporization with the symbol delta H. Okay. And then in sub, excuse me, in subscript, we write VAP. So it's either, we call this either the molar heat of vaporization or the enthalpy of vaporization, either way. Either way you want to call it. Okay, uh, so let me also write that, enthalpy of vaporization. Okay, so the molar heat of vaporization or the enthalpy of, of vaporization, whichever way you want to call this, this is the energy required to vaporize one mole of a liquid. Okay. Now, this, rate, this relationship between vapor pressure of a liquid, okay, and the absolute temperature is given by an equation called the clashes clapeyron equation. And the clashes clapeyron equation says this, that if you take... If you take the neg the natural log of the vapor pressure, okay, this is going to be equal to the negative molar heat of vaporization, okay, delta H vap, divided by the products of R times T. R is going to be, remember, the universal gas constant. T is the temperature plus some sort of constant, we call that C. So the way this is set up, this is almost like a differential equation, okay? I, I'm gonna nerd out for a little bit, so get ready. So before we jump into you know some derivations and why this equation is kind of cool, let's check out, let, let's make sure that we're cool in these terms. So P VAP, P sub VAP, this is called the vapor pressure. Okay, R, that's our universal gas constant. And that value is going to be 8.314 joules per K mole. Now, since it's K, that means our temperature system, T, that means it's, T is temperature. And since we got a K in the R term, that means we're using Kelvin. Okay. And just so we're on the same page to convert from, from Celsius to Kelvin, we take the degrees Celsius and then add 273 to it, and that gives us the degrees Kelvin. All right, so there we go. So if we take the natural log of the vapor pressure, that's going to be equal to the negative molar heat of vaporization divided by the product of the universal gas constant times the, times the temperature, okay, plus some sort of proportionality constant C. Now, we don't know what C is because we've got to identify that. So let, let's see if we, can, if we can rearrange this equation a little bit. Now, what's really nifty about this equation is that this almost, if we were to graph this, this almost takes the, value, the, the form of Y equals MX plus B, okay? which mx plus b, this is the form of a norm. This is usually our form of a, of a normal straight line, okay? Where m is the slope, b is another y-intercept, and then x and y are your variables. x is the independent, y is dependent. So if we can take this clashes clapeyron equation and we can, you know, use that to create a graph in the form y, y equals mx plus b, this case, y, if, I, if I'm going to rewrite the clashes clapeyron equation, y would be the natural log of the vapor pressure, okay? 
m, the slope, that's going to be equal to the negative molar heat of vaporization divided by r. The x part is going to be 1 over the temperature, because remember the relationship here is going to be the vapor pressure versus temperature. And then the b part, that's our c, that's the constant, that's what we need to define. So that's how this would work. Pretty cool. And one of the big things, this is actually, I'm, I'm kind of glad this is coming up a little bit early on in the course. The reason why this course tends to be a little bit more difficult is that we're allowing the mathematics to tell the story. And so, so this is kind of the story that we're seeing, that there's a relationship here that, that we're establishing between temperature and vapor pressure. All right, anyhow. So if you know the values of the molar heat of vaporization, and you know the pressure of a liquid at a certain temperature, then you can actually use the clashes clapeyron equation to calculate the vapor pressure of a liquid at a different temperature. All right, so let's say you've got uh, one equation. Let's say you got a temperature and a pressure. We're going to call temperature T1, pressure P1. Okay, using the clashes clapeyron equation, if we have those two temperatures and pressure, uh, the temperature and pressure here, we would say the natural log of P1 is going to be equal to the negative molar heat of vaporization divided by RT1 plus the constant. And let's say you have another set of pressure and temperature. In this case, P2 and then T2. So the negative log of P2 would be equal to the negative molar heat of vaporization divided by RT2 plus C. But wait, let me ask a question. Before, before we go any further, why is the molar heat of vaporization the same for both of these? That means that the, the, the reason why they're the same is that we're not changing the identity of the liquid or, or the material that we're studying. So that means that this molar heat of the vaporization has to be the same because we're not changing the identity. It's still the same, it's still the same entity that we're studying. So what we want to do is subtract the second equation from the first equation. So you get something like this. The natural log of P1 minus P2 is going to be equal to the negative molar heat of vaporization divided by RT1 minus then uh, we're going to subtract the other fraction, molar heat of vaporization, divided by RT2. Okay, and then you're going to have a plus C. You're going to have a subtracting a minus C, so those cancel out. That's cool. So the way that we would rewrite this new equation is that the uh, simplifying everything and using our, our properties of natural logs, we would get that the, the log... A P1 divided by P2 is going to be equal to the positive molar heat of vaporization divided by R times the quantity 1 over 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. Now there is another way of writing this a little bit. So some books will give it to you this way. Sometimes the equation could be given to you like this. The natural log of P1 over P2 is going to be equal to the molar heat of vaporization divided by R times the quantity T1 minus T2 Time, uh, divided by the quantity T1 times T2, okay? So depending on what book you're reading, you, you could be given either equation. Either equation's fine. You're going to get to the right number. All right, so let's see how this equation works. Let's see it. Let's play this out. So here's our question. The, molar, the vapor pressure of ethanol is 100 millimeters of mercury at... 34.9. I wrote over that. So let's let's let me erase this a little bit. All right. So 34.9 degrees Celsius. 
what is its vapor pressure at 63.5 at degrees Celsius? The molar heat of vaporization for ethanol is 39.3 kilojoules per mole. All right, so we got some information. Let's see what we got. We're told the molar heat of vaporization is 39.3 kilojoules per mole. Okay, we know that T1 is 34.9 degrees Celsius. And if we convert that to Kelvin, that's going to be 307.9 Kelvin. The P1 that goes along with that is 100 millimeters of mercury. The second temperature is 63.5 degrees Celsius. If we convert that to Kelvin, that would be 336.5 Kelvin. P2, that's what we're looking at. That's what the problem's asking us. Okay. So that's going to be our question mark. Now, there's one other piece of information that we do know of. We know that the universal gas constant is 8.314 joules per kmol. All right. So here it is. We're solving for P2. So if this is our equation, let me rewrite again. The natural log of P1 divided by P2 is equal to the molar heat of vaporization divided by R times the quantity T1 minus T2 divided by T1 times T2. So that's the equation we're working with. Okay. Now, one thing before we jump into this. If you take a look at that R value, it has units of joules per kmol. The molar heat of vaporization has units of kilojoules per mole. So we want to make sure that that R value is going to, is going to agree with whatever the molar heat of vaporization is. So I'll tell you what, let's convert the molar heat of vaporization back to joules so that way the, the molar heat of vaporization and the R agree with each other. So that means if I rewrite the molar heat of vaporization this time, that would give us 39,300 joules per mole. All right, so let's let's pop in what we've got. So the natural log, let me let me draw a line right here. The natural log of 100 millimeters of mercury, which is that's our P1 divided by P2 is equal to the molar heat of vaporization, so 39,300 joules per mole, divided by our R value, 8.314 joules per K mole, multiplied by the temperatures. So you've got 307.9 Kelvin minus 336.5 Kelvin, which already, 307.9 minus 336, that's going to give you a negative number already. Okay, divided by the product of those two, 307.9 times 336.5. Okay. So if we simplify everything on the right-hand side, and what I'm going to do now to make things a little bit easier, I wrote out all the units. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop the units now just to make make life a little bit easier. So we've got this left hand side, which is a natural log of 100 divided by P2, 39,300 divided by 8.314 should give us a product of or should give us a number of 4726.97. Okay, the everything in the parentheses, the temperatures. If we take 307.9, subtract 336.5 from it, and then multiply, divide that by the product of the two, we should get negative 2.8 times 10 to the minus fourth. Okay, so if we multiply, if we multiply those two values out, if I multiply these two values out, the 4726 times the negative 2.8 times 10 to the minus fourth, I get negative 1.323. And that's going to be equal to the natural log of 100 divided by P2. 
All right, so now we're at that point. We got to get rid of that natural log. So the way to undo a natural log is to take everything on the left-hand side, and that's going to be the exponent for e, the natural number. Okay, so if we take e raised to the natural log of 100 divided by p2, we're going to do the same thing for the right-hand side. So the negative 1.323 is going to be our exponent for e. So if we get that, the e cancels out the natural log, so that way we're going to be left with 100 divided by p2. This is going to be equal to e raised to the negative 1.323. Okay. So uh, it, now we just got to, you know, get this p2 by itself. So if we multiply both sides by p2, we get 100 is equal to p2 times e raised to the negative 1.323. Okay. What we're going to divide do then is to divide by the, the e. So that way we got p2 is equal to 100 divided by e raised to the negative 1.323. And so that final number that we get when we take e uh, 100 divided by e raised to the negative 1.323, that number should be about 375 millimeters of mercury. So that's pretty cool. That's how the clashes clapron equation works. Okay, so a uh, couple things, be, uh, one more thing before we take a look at our next equilibrium. Okay, how is boiling point related to vapor, vapor pressure? Or how is that related to the molar heat of vaporization? So first off, what is boiling point? Boiling point is a temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to the external temperature or external pressure, which is one atmosphere. So how is that related? Well, here's a table of materials. So you've got argon, where you have a boiling point of negative 186 degrees Celsius, molar heat of vaporization is 6.3 kilojoules per mole. If we take a look at something closer to argon, methane has a boiling point of negative 164 degrees Celsius. The molar heat of vaporization is 9.2. Uh, something that's closer, it looks like you got diethyl ether that has a boiling point of about 34.6. So, uh, you know, a, a nice, nice day, nice summer day. Molar heat of vaporization is 26. And so what we tend to look at is that, is that as the as the boiling point goes higher, increases, the molar heat of vaporization should also increase. So as you're increasing the boiling points, you're going to increase the molar heat of vaporization. Now, this is not perfect by any means. This is not a one-to-one -one ratio. But if we're talking about generalities, generally speaking, as the boiling point increases, the molar heat of vaporization should also increase. Now, every substance will also have a critical temperature and a critical pressure. Critical temperature is known as the highest temperature at which a substance can exist as a liquid. Okay, so that's the highest temperature that something can exist as a liquid. Now, if you go above that point, the gas phase cannot be made to liquefy no matter what the pressure is. So at that point, it becomes gas no matter what. Okay, so that's like the point of no return unless you cool down the, the mixture. You also have a critical pressure. And the critical pressure is going to be the minimum pressure that must be applied to bring about liquefaction at the critical temperature. So there's got to be, critical temperature is like the highest temperature that a substance can exist as a liquid. Critical pressure is the minimum pressure that you need to bring it back to the liquid phase at that critical temperature. All right, and with that, now we're ready to take a look at our next equilibrium. Let's take a look at the liquid-solid equilibrium now. So the transformation of liquid to solid is called freezing. The transformation of, liquid, of solid to liquid is called melting or fusion. 
And so the melting point this is going to be the, the point of a, or the freezing point of the liquid is the temperature at which the solid and liquid phases coexist in equilibrium. So instead of looking at the molar heat of vaporization, we look at the molar heat of fusion. And this is going to be the energy that's required to melt one mole of a solid. So if we take everything that we talked about with the, with a liquid vapor equilibrium, and we take what we just, you know, the terms that we just uh, learned about this liquid solid equilibrium, we can put together a heating curve. And this is what a heating curve looks like. So what's nice is that every time you see a straight line here, that indicates that you've got an equilibrium. Or you've got some sort of transformation. Okay, so every time you see a straight line or a horizontal line, that means you've got some sort of equilibrium set up or a transformation. You're going from solid to liquid or liquid to gas. Any team, anytime you see an increase like that, you're only dealing with one species or one phase. Okay, now you can have something called supercooling, which means that a liquid can be temporarily cooled to below its freezing point. And this happens when heat is removed from a liquid so rapidly that molecules literally have no time to form the structured or the ordered structure of a solid. Now, this is extremely unstable, and usually movement or adding a seed crystal causes the solution to solidify. If you ever, there's an experiment, I don't know if you guys have seen this, where you take a bottle of water. I do not recommend to do this, but if you take a bottle of water, put it in a freezer. And you don't open that bottle, so it's brand new, sealed up, all that stuff. You put it in the freezer, and then you take it out. It's still, ice hasn't formed, so it's like pure water. And then all you have to do is, like, slam it on the counter, and it, you can see the ice actually form. And so that's kind of what it is. So in order for that solid to form, you need some sort of movement, some sort of bump, or some sort of seed crystal that mimics the structure that you want the liquid, to, uh, the solid to form. Once you have that, then that, that solid actually forms. It's actually pretty cool. All right, so the last phase or last transformation that we want to take a look at is called the solid liquid transformation or equilibrium. In this case, we're talking about sublimation. Sublimation is the process in which molecules go directly from the solid phase to the gas phase and skip becoming a liquid. Okay. The reverse of uh, sublimation is called deposition, where you're taking the vapor and it goes into the gas phase and again skips the vapor phase, uh, liquid phase completely. So instead of measuring the molar heat of vaporization or the molar heat of fusion, we are now talking about the molar heat of sublimation. This is the energy required to sublime one mole of a solid. And this, this value, the molar heat of sublimation, is going to be equal to the sum of the molar heats of fusion and the molar heat of vaporization. We can put all the information that we've talked about so far, the liquid vapor equilibrium, the solid liquid equilibrium and the solid vapor equilibrium. We can put all of these pieces of information together into a single graph, and we call that graph a phase diagram. And this summarizes the conditions at which a substance exists as a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now the point at which all three of these curves, the solid liquid equilibrium, the liquid vapor equilibrium, and the solid vapor equilibrium, this is all called the triple point. So there's one point at which all three of these curves combine or meet, and that's called the triple point. This is the only condition under which all three phases can be in equilibrium with one another. And so now what we've got here are some examples of a phase diagram. Okay, so on the y on the y axis we've got pressure, on the x axis we've got temperature. And usually what we do is try to call out what is going to be the liquid phase or try to call out the boiling point and the melting point. Okay, so you've got the boiling point. Again, the boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor 
pre vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to the external pressure. So that usually we call that one atmosphere. Okay, so what I've done is circle our boiling point. We also try to figure out what temp at what temperature does our material also melt? So we're calling that out as well. Again, that's going to be at one atmosphere. Now, we also want to pay attention to the triple point. And so I'm going to circle to that again. The triple point is when all three of these curves intera uh, intersect each other. So you've got one curve that's going to be your solid, lic or solid vapor equilibrium. Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to call that out right here. So that's your solid vapor curve. You're going to have another curve that's going to be a solid liquid curve. And then you're going to have a third curve, which is your liquid gas or a liquid vapor curve. Okay, so literally it's taking the graphs of three, plot, three plots and putting them together. So we want to identify on a, on a kind of on a, on a phase diagram, we want to make sure that we can find the boiling point, we want to find the melting point, we also want to find the triple point. Now, the other thing that we also want to identify, which can be trick, which can be tricky, we want to identify the critical temperature. And if we identify the critical temperature, if we can, I also identify the critical pressure okay and so that's what we're looking at now what's kind of cool is that usually the solid vapor curve is going to go is going to increase so you're going to have a positive slope the liquid vapor curve will also increase so you're going to have a positive slope okay now the so, the solid liquid curve usually will be going down so you're going to have a negative slope there. There is one species however where that solid liquid curve actually is positive and that is for CO2. So the phase diagram that we're looking at on the right hand side this curve right here for solid liquid is actually positive instead of being negative. So you have three positive curves here. 